Well, I suspect we'll have several people hop on today, um, probably non-farmers hop on today. Um, at least I hope so. Uh, this is, for me, Sterling, uh, this is kind of my number two report of the year. Where do you put it in, in course of importance out there? Uh, this report is important because we're right now in the middle of a new starved period. Yeah. The WASDs aren't going to matter all that much until we get to May. So we don't get a lot of news. So this report looms larger because of that. Now, as you both know, the deviations from this, from what we get to the acres report and what our final uh, harvested acres numbers can be great. And that will, you know, certainly affect the tone, but this does usually kick off seeing the December corn and the November soybeans contracts trade a little more independently. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Also, well, actually, do you want to officially start at 1045? Is that when you want to officially kick off? Um, it's entirely up to you guys. I have the um, the time set for 1045, so we're probably going to have some people Perfect. not fully on until 1045. Remind me, remind me, and then we can do kind of an official kickoff in about four minutes. Okay, yep, absolutely. We're already recording, so just whenever you want to start, okay. we're good to go. Well, I don't want to get I don't want to repeat information. I don't want to get too deep into it. I want to let a few more people get on here. Yep, absolutely. You know, we'll have people jumping on all the way up until time to the call, so. Sure. Sterling, I don't know whether I'm um, like I'm officially back to work or this. I don't know what you call this after being on the road for <clears throat> about twelve weeks. It's a, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a different game whenever you come up to your office early in the morning and sit in front of a screen. Oh, that's what I do every day. So it's, uh, it's getting a little different. The markets are starting to wake up. Uh, a little bit. Um, this is also the last day of the quarter. And remember, tomorrow is a market holiday, but not a holiday for anything else. So. Okay, trying to figure out how I can be not looking so small in the background here, and uh, thus far I've not been able to overcome the technology, unless I guess I get really close to this thing, but that's not going to happen. So get the zoom in. Yeah, I saw um, which cat was it that took on Jim Cramer the other day. That was Rosie. She was arguing with Jim Cramer. He was okay. talking and she was making uh, quite the racket going on against Mr. Cramer. So, so are, you, are you a one cat family right now or two cats? No, two. Pip is still around. And if you look, okay. the quarterly staff meeting uh, was held this morning between 930 and 10. And they were ah, okay. both okay. in here uh, making their demands and complaints about. I was wondering what your secret to success was. Now I know. Yeah, it's, it's it's my office staff. That's they're the ones who really uh, really do everything. Oh, let's go ahead here and let's we'll start sharing the quote board until we're ready to go here. <laughs> Beans a little bit lower. There is uh, some news reports floating around coming out of our friends in China that their hog herd may be a little bit smaller due to uh, decreased uh, farmer margins. And I think that's got the soybean market a little nervous right now. I think that sell-off started a little bit yesterday. It just looked like it turned pretty quick yesterday and then really never recovered. You know, we petered out Tuesday uh, afternoon, right about lunchtime. We started selling off both in corn and beans, and then we saw the follow-through yesterday. 
So a little bit of nervousness in front of this report. So again, we're just going to have to see what numbers the government throws at us. Our export sales for soybeans today were not very good. They were a little better for corn, a little better for wheat, week over week. Cotton seems to be trying to pick back up a little bit. So yeah, cotton's, uh, cotton's got a nice number there. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Ashley, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. I'll wait just a few seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, we're ready to go. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody out to the ASNA special report. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, in my opinion, this is one of the top reports of the year that you need to be tuned into. For me, it's number two, but we're going to take a look at Perspective acres today and a whole lot more. Sterling, what's in store for us in today's report? Well, today we're going to talk about perspective planting, which is the government's survey of farmers to what they're actually going to plant. And let's go ahead here and switch, and we can talk about what we're going to, uh, what we're going to be expecting for this, and what uh, what may very well come from this. So, Sterling, while you do that, you, you mentioned. This is kind of the start of a new season. Now, today's opening day in Major League Baseball, so a lot of you will be watching games later on this afternoon and tonight. It's the first of 162 games, and in a sense, Sterling, this is kind of opening day for new crop uh, commodities. Uh, we're going to have this report, and then as the months go by, we're going to see the conditions. We're going to get a get a, another big report at the end of June, but this kind of kicks things off, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And uh, expectations are that we're going to see about 91 spot 8 uh, million acres of corn planted. That's a little bit bigger than what the Outlook Conference uh, had thought for soybeans, looking at about 86.5. So those are going to be the two big numbers here. The wheat number at 47 spot 2 is not too, ch too much changed from the Outlook Conference. So that number may not be quite as big of a deal as uh, what we were looking for. One other thing we're going to be watching down here is the sorghum number. At 7.12, where we're expected to be, that's noticeably higher than where we were last time around. So are we going to lose some corn and bean acres to sorghum? That's a possibility. The other one to watch here is the cotton number. At 11 spot... 293. We're about in line, maybe just a smidge bigger than last year. Are we, with the improved cotton prices that we've seen in the general improvement in exports, are we going to see more cotton acres come into play? Now that's the prospective planning report. We got something else going on today too. We have a quarterly stocks report. A lot of variation on where they think these numbers are going to be. 8.4 for corn was the average expectation. 18.35 was for soybeans. Now, I think this bean number may be a little bit overstated. We may be able to see that a little bit smaller. For wheat, uh, pretty much about as expected. So we've got more going on today than uh, what we have seen uh, in the past. So what we, if we see you know, a bigger corn number, bigger corn stocks number, that will probably be a little bit okay simply because we're a little bit behind on the pace of exports. The soybean export pace is actually right in line with the five-year average. So seeing that number for soybean quarterly stocks, I think we could come in a little bit smaller. That would definitely be helpful to the market because it certainly looks like that acres number um, for soybeans is going to be substantially higher than it was last year. So yeah. Yeah, this is going to be a wild card. And as we head in and we actually get this crop planted, Sterling, one thing I think is for certain is these numbers are going to change a lot between now and that June 30th report uh, that kind of solidifies the number of acres that are out there. Absolutely. One, you know, will we see any switching? Will this produce a market reaction, you know, where it pushes corn up a little bit, maybe pushes beans down a little bit? We'll see. I think this is pretty well priced in. And also, you know, weather comes into play here. And right now, the weather looks to be fairly favorable, and it looks like the weather patterns are going to improve, which wouldn't cause too many changes. But if we get sudden bouts of rain, things get pushed back a little bit, uh, we could see more bean acres and corn acres. you got so many factors here. You talk about weather being one of them. Economics is another one. 
you know, that sorghum number you talked about coming up, cotton number coming up, that cotton price certainly better um, versus corn or soybeans uh, when you look at them versus last year. Inputs on sorghum a little bit lighter um, than corn. So there's a lot of factors here that are going to play into what actually happens over the next 60 days. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, again, this is also the kickoff. Really, we should start seeing new crop futures, meaning December and November, trading a little more independently. Right now, they've basically been followers of old crop. But now we've got some information that's getting a little more tangible, and that may, you know, affect some fund positioning, uh, maybe noticeably, as they could probably start building some additional positioning going into those new crop contracts, which right now is, you know, fairly minimal. We talk about this being opening day, kind of for the new crop commodities. Um, you know, we're going to see, I don't want to look past this report already before it comes out, but Sterling, we're, we're not that far away from some market volatility with this double crop corn down in Brazil. And then, of course, this crop in the U.S. And one one outlier that we kind of forgotten about, we may have overhyped it two years ago, but Ukraine still got a big role in world supply on corn and where that stocks number comes in in the U.S. in the future. Oh, absolutely. If we see, you know, further issues there and some of that supply can't make it into the market or it's not actually grown, that tightens the global balance sheet, which in turn would be beneficial to U.S. corn right now. Right now, we are not the big exporter. This would be particularly beneficial if we didn't see wheat coming out of the Ukraine, as our wheat exports are expected this year to be the lowest in 30 years. You know, speaking of Ukraine, to take a look at that acreage trend over the last three years and, and maybe how poorly we forecast acreage three years ago, versus the last two that were war years in Ukraine. Not a big change in wheat acres, not a big change in barley acres, not really a big change in their, their oil seed acres, and, and a significant reduction in corn. But I think had we been asked that question three years ago, how would 24 months of war impact Ukraine? We would think those corn acres would come down significantly more than what they did. Last year, Ukraine was able to get around 850 million bushels of corn into the export market. And so that's just a direct competition with us. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And China has been noticeably absent from the export corridor in corn with the U.S. In fact, we've seen zero export sales or nearly zero uh, for the past several weeks. And for the past several months, we have not shipped any corn to speak of. Uh, really into China. That's something that this could change if we see the problems in the Ukraine. Uh, one thing I will say about China for their cotton imports and actually their soybean exports are moving a little bit ahead of expectations. Cotton noticeably, but we are right at the five-year average for soybean exports going into China, which is, I think, better than a lot of people thought we would see. I think uh, there was a lot of ideas that it was going to be Brazil and all Brazil. While we're not growing those exports any, the, the amount of decline has been a little bit less. So it's a relatively bullish situation. One other thing we have going on, we have a couple of outside markets moving. And when we talk about funds, we're usually talking about CTAs, directly managed active trading accounts, because they drive most of the day-to-day -day volatility. There's another kind of fund out there, and it's a commodity index fund. And retirement plans, things like that, uh, like CalPERS, use these to buy commodities broadly. This is something that can work to lift the floor in the grain markets. And what gets people excited about buying commodities, there's two commodities that people really get excited about. One is crude oil, the other one is gold. Now, crude oil right now is at 82.68 a barrel, up another $1.34. It looks like we're going to be able to hold $80 a barrel. And the global situation is such, Russia has lost some productive capacity due to the war in Ukraine. They've also lost some export capacity. Iraq has stopped uh, some of their oil exports. Against the backdrop of the U.S. increasing our oil production, we now produce more oil currently 
than any country in the world has ever produced. We are number one. So the good news with that is that is helping keep the component prices, at least in the U.S., a little bit under control. But we are seeing global oil prices rise. The other one is our little friend, the yellow rocks. That's gold, which I'm going to adjust some thinking on gold here. Inflation is not gold's favorite food anymore. The food is anti-dollar. So if you think the dollar is lower, going to go lower, you buy gold. It is also anti-fiat currency anywhere else in the world. And I'm going to add a third one to this for gold. Gold is also becoming anti-Bitcoin, being something completely different from Bitcoin. So if you want to hedge and lay off risk in Bitcoin, I think this is a very nascent thing. I think this is just starting. But I think part of the rise in gold is being fueled by people trying to diversify off of some of these Bitcoin positions they have. So a little bit of potential support just around the corner outside of our base commodities. Back to looking at these acreage estimates. Sterling, I believe a little birdie told me that you think that corn estimate is a little high. What is the official uh, Sterling Smith guess on corn today? My, my official guess on corn is a little bit lower than the Outlook Conference. I'm at about 90.9, and I think the soybean number may be just a little bit soft. I think we may see that maybe a couple of ticks bigger than what the Outlook Conference posted. So those items combined may make this a little bullish for corn, maybe a little neutral, a little bearish for soybeans. Where I think those acres are going to go, I think we're going to see them go into cotton. And I think they're going to go into sorghum a little bit. That's that's my current thinking. Again, this is a squirrely report because it's intentions. So intentions are not what actually happens. And we'll be revisiting this through the entire spring as weather will become a much, much bigger factor. I think that's well put, and that's a lot of the reason we mentioned so many of these other factors, because we may see this pop on, see a flash in the pan, a reaction to these numbers, and then we may very well be dealing with, with outside markets, uh, like we talked about, in, in an hour after this trade is released. Well, I've changed my charts for today's report. Usually, you know, you have a daily chart up here, and I'm assuming you all can see this. This is a one minute chart. Actually, it's a tick chart of the corn market because I think we will get a pretty good initial reaction off of this. And unless there's a big surprise in that uh, quarterly stocks report, we may very well corn up a half a cent. And let's see, new crop right now down three quarters of a cent. New crop beans are down 13 and a half. So we do have. Uh, you know, the potential in the soybeans, if the soybeans are a little heavy and this report can be at all bullish, either one of them, I think we could, you know, kind of launch the soybeans. But if we get, you know, a big heavy ending stock, heavy quarterly stocks number on the soybeans, you know, that may be a little bit of a problem for the soybean market as we've kind of reached some key levels. We had a key retracement level. And for May soybeans, that $12 level has become a real problem. There seems to be some willing sellers, and they may very well be farmers, willing to sell anytime soybeans get around 12 bucks. Certainly feels that way as we get into a time period where cash is a little bit a little bit tight and our actions need to be geared more towards planning than hauling old crop. It seems like some of those soybeans have turned into cash on the farm over the last couple of weeks. Certainly, I really liked your comments about an all bullish report, and so many times we overlook that stocks number. That soybean stocks number may very well um, steer the trade over the next couple of hours. Yeah, if you're looking, you know, we're at 1835. If this comes anywhere south of 1.8, that would probably be seen as pretty bullish for the soybean market. The soybean market would take hold of that. And we still have big fun shorts in all of this, even though they've kind of eased up from their record levels. There will be plenty of aggressive behavior um, towards, towards the soybeans if that number comes in. My official guess for the soybean ending stocks number was 17, 1.76 billion. So when I, when I put the math together and all of it, that's the number that came out. 
and I'm actually the lowest guy on the street. So I'm actually trying to help the team out here, trying to push these uh, beans higher. You're doing everything we can do, right? Everything we can do, but it's uh, a bit like uh, trying to lift a very heavy object. One other thing, I've had a few questions about the bridge in Baltimore. It will affect ethanol, it'll affect cars coming in, and it will affect cocoa. And here it is 11 o'clock, and we are due for our report here. And hopefully the gerbils at Bloomberg are running as fast as they can here. And uh, we should get a report populating here any moment. Six something here. And it doesn't look like uh, the USDA has launched said report yet because the markets are not moving at all. And there may be a technological glitch with the USDA here. We are uh, fully 30 seconds past, and we have not gotten our report yet. And actually, somebody's got it. The markets are moving. Corn at 435 is up $0.08. Cents. July soybeans, oh, we have recovered. November beans are at, uh, where are we at here? We're 11.76. So the corn number, 90 spot zero three six so smaller than expected soybeans 86 spot five also a little bit smaller than expected sorghum number six spot three nine everybody missed that number in a big way the wheat number came in at 47 spot four so everyone was a little bit smaller there the cotton number 1067, also noticeably smaller. You know, wow. when we add up all these numbers, we are going to be a little bit tight on things. Corn ending stocks at 8.34. Soybean stocks at 1845, bigger than the average estimate. And all wheat at 1087, also a little bit bigger than the average estimate. So let's go ahead here and switch over to uh, some prices here. We'll start there's December corn. Look at that up nine and a half cents. Excellent. And let's go Excellent. and look at November beans. Well, they're not positive on the day, but they're not nearly as bad as they were. <laughs> I mean, we were down 13, we're only down five. I mean, you don't want to be the guy who's short down here. Um, how so, old crop, how old crop numbers performed on corn and beans, Sterling? Corn up about nine cents, so pretty much in line with new crop. And old crop soybeans, yeah, pretty much still tagging right along here. Uh, we had a nice initial spike. We had the obvious recoil. We'll see here if the market can gather a little bit of strength down here. That is, you know, that can be part of it. These reports, it takes a little bit of time to digest. The wheat market is doing better. May wheat in Chicago is at 558. That's up 10 and a half. Kansas City, 586, that's up eight and a half. Minneapolis looks like it's up about 10 cents. So in general, the markets are telling us that this report is bullish for corn and going back to that acre number, that is well below what the, uh, what the typical guess is. And so soybeans here, we're at 186. So if we add up these two numbers or expectations were, we're running just about a million acres shy of what we normally plant. So that adds a new dynamic here. Will these acres that uh, so far there's no intention to plant, will they get drug into service as planting season moves on? That will be something that we will need to pay attention to. And you know, Sterling, one, one number that's not in here that, you know, I think most of us in the crop insurance industry have to kind of keep in the back of our minds, and that's prevent plant. I know we've got some training on that as a company uh, here over the next week. But you have to ask yourself, you know, it's been a little bit wetter uh, in the south, um, been a little drier up north, smaller planting window in the Dakotas for corn. How does prevent plant factor into this? Much too early to tell, but it's something we need to, uh, to keep our eye on. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because we're coming in with really a pretty soft corn number. So, and actually the soybean number Kind of failed to meet expectations as well. So both of these numbers are a little bit smaller than expected. The soybeans are not getting as much of a push from it simply because their ending stocks number was bigger than expected. 
but the corn stocks number was actually a little bit lower. So that is uh, the markets uh, pretty much reacting about as one would expect with this. Well, we'll take it. We'll take it. It seems like we have ridden a uh, kind of a, a, a down roller coaster for a while without a lot of bullish news. Hopefully this is a, a new start and again, beginning of volatility season. So um, yes, from every day we go forward, we're going to have new stories that directly impact new crop. Uh, maybe not in the next two weeks, but certainly in three to four, as we start to see where we're at in the fields, also start to see, watch that Brazilian uh, corn crop and uh, see where we're at there. Yeah, right now, uh, old crop is leading. We're seeing a little bit of strength, which that actually is probably good because we're going to have to get old crop out of the doldrums before we're going to get new crop uh, feeling any more spunky about this. Yeah, you know, you've got December corn pulled up. I'll throw a statistic out there that uh, you guys can test and, and test something to look at. But when we look at uh, new crop highs on the calendar year, specifically in the month of January, I'll just talk about December corn here. Our December corn high was right around 501 during the month of January. And um, about 36 years of history shows that we have traded that January high 36 out of 36 years. So um, you wanna put a target on this corn. Um, when it's gonna happen, I certainly wish I knew, but I like that I like that $5 mark. I don't know if I would test the 501 or not, Sterling. I wouldn't play any games. If it got to five, I'd be ready to go. Yeah. Um, and here we can see again, you know, this is December corn futures uh, and their seasonal tendencies. So we are right now, we are in March. So looking at March, typically here, and I'll get you a little better history here. Let's do 10 years rather than five. And see, typically we see strength coming out into May and June. That's when we've made the best highs and also the highest lows. So we are starting to come in again, beginning to look into that period of volatility. Yeah, this has been a really, really tough market to look back on and say the chart suggests a sale at a particular level. Um, because this chart really has not shown us any opportunities at all. Um, kind of that, kind of that, that chart that really from July 9th of last year, Sterling has just been a slow grind down and that's a tough market to trade in. Yeah. Bear markets are called bear markets for a reason. And it doesn't matter if it's corn or soybeans, crude oil, or uh, shares of NVIDIA. If the market is heavy, it becomes more difficult. You can see here we had our big spike, we had our recoil, and then we have just continually ground lower and lower and lower. However, I'm going to go out on a limb here for new, well, this is new crop. This low so far looks pretty good. That corresponded directly to a record fund short position. With weather volatility being what it's been for the last five years, I think it would be hard to assume that we're going to see some aggressive sort of uh, selling by funds pushing us back to that record level. So that takes some of the selling pressure out. We now have a second bottom here right around the 460 area. And we'll see. We'll see. We'll give it some time to test. But again, not saying we're going up like a rocket ship. But maybe the uh, beatings will uh, cease and desist a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a uh, it's been a brutal few months here. Well, Sterling, we've kind of covered um, the the major points of this and seen the pulse of the market reaction. Anything to follow up with? We're about mm -hmm. ten after here. I don't want to keep everybody mm -hmm. from a beautiful day out there. Anything yes. you need to see that needs to be mentioned? Yes, this is a chart of new crop soybeans. Notice, as they digest the report, we're doing better. In fact, this is a bit of bullish activity here. We had the big wick down, and now we've come back up. There's obviously a disturbing clear line of resistance here. But 
Uh, this is a lot better than it was just a few minutes ago. We're now up th three and a quarter cents and trading fully, what is that, 20, about 20 cents off the worst levels of the day in the soybeans. So um, that is something that is fairly good. Some of this is obviously bleeding over from the corn, but this is a good sign that maybe we're shaking some of those fund sellers out of the market. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So our next meeting will be the April WASD. And what day is the April WASD on, Brooks? Well, let me take a look here, see if we've got it on our, we don't have it on our calendars this year, but it may very well be the 11th. Um, that's on a Thursday, but don't, let's not, uh, let's not put that down yet. I don't, I'm not certain what that day is. Here, let's yeah. punch it, it up is, here. It is April 11th at 1045. Okay. All right. Okay, Brooks, you do, uh, you do remember that I am going to be on at April 11th, uh, is the day for it. You do remember that I am going to be on vacation that week. Well, we're going to be doing this one in a unique spot. We're going to be doing this one from Washington, D.C., so, uh. Hopefully, I've got a, a good hotel room with the Capitol in the background um, and uh, not some back alley. But, yeah, we'll definitely be broadcasting that from Washington. The good news is it is the April WASD. If you're looking for surprises in a WASD, that would be about the last one where I'd look for surprises other than December. I think I'm back now, Sterling. Yeah, you're that. back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the April WASD. And if you're looking for surprises in a WASD, April and December are two months where you're probably best off not looking because usually there is not much going on because the only thing that they will probably change are exports. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, hey, we'll take this one, Sterling. We need yeah. to. Win. We need yeah, it. This is this, this is a good one. win for the corn. This is a solid yeah. win for the corn and the soybeans. Well, it stopped the leaking and the wheat's actually doing a little bit better here. So very good. Well, for those of you who get a three day weekend, have a uh, have a great one. I get outside and enjoy some of the spring weather. And we will talk to you on April 11th. Yes, thank you, everyone. And remember, the market's the last day of trading for the quarter and the week is today. There will be a DMO tomorrow because it's not a government holiday, so the COT reports will be coming out as normal. Have a great day. Take care.